Uh, morning, everybody. Uh, glad to see you all here on a Sunday morning. I guess you can consider it still morning, right? Yeah, I do. <laughs> Dragon Con. I'm three hours behind you in my brain. Yeah. So. <laughs> True. <laughs> um, so today we're going to be talking about data scraping. Um, I'm sure a lot of you who have technical experience in here will have a lot of thoughts, maybe you've used data scraping in the past. Um, so we'll give a brief explainer. We'll do some introductions, of course, as well, and then talk kind of about the ethical and legal implications of using data scraping. So first and foremost, my name is Tatiana Rice. I'm a lawyer and policy counsel with the Future of Privacy Forum. We are a nonprofit think tank uh, dedicated to privacy <laughs> of everything uh, and really working together with policymakers, industry, academics, civil society to um, make better policy about uh, technology and how we're using it and how it continues to advance our society. So, uh, Haley, you want to do a brief introduction? Yeah, sure. So, hi, I'm Haley Tsukayama. I'm Senior Legislative Activist at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. We're a, a, sorry, we're a nonprofit dedicated to promoting digital rights in the modern age. Um, I am not a lawyer, which is something you'll probably hear me say a lot today. Tatiana certainly heard me say it a lot. Um, I got to EFF after uh, spending eight years as a reporter at the Washington Post covering technology, um, and then I uh, w was sick of writing about all the controversies and wanted to weigh in on them myself, so that's how I got to EFF. Cool. Um, so just a quick poll from the audience. Does anybody know what data scraping is? All right, a few people, most people, I would say. Cool. Um, so feel free to honestly jump in if I say anything wrong, because like Haley's disclaimer is she's not a lawyer. My disclaimer is I am not a technologist. This is just how I've come to learn it over, over the year. Um, so data scraping as like a fundamental is just the automatic extraction of information from the internet, largely. Um, data you can, of course, do off the internet, but I would say probably most of the data scraping happens right now off of the web. And so a lot of that data is, of course, used to be able to train AI um, and be able to glean relevant information. So there's a couple different buckets in my head in terms of how that's used. Um, you could use it for your internal research, you could use it to be developing a product, you could be using it um, even just to display information on a web page. Um, so I think one of the easiest examples that comes to my head is like prices for real estate. Pretty easy thing to access and probably pull pretty automatically from the internet, um, be able to compile the data so you can make some t statistics about, you know, this is what maybe the average price looks like in this neighborhood versus this neighborhood, or even if you're just a real estate agent um, trying to figure out what prices should look like. Uh, Haley, want to add anything on to that description? Um, let's see. I mean, you know, I think when we're thinking about scraping, there are also things like web crawlers, right? Um, certainly from a journalism background, like there's oh, a lot true. of <laughs> there's sure. a lot of data scraping that we use to gather information um, from publicly available sources. Mm. So it, it covers a lot of activities, I would say. Cool. Um, so I guess let's jump right in. Haley, based on your background and just <laughs> <laughs> general thoughts, do you think uh, data scraping is ethical? Is it legal? What are some of the issues with it? So, uh, so I certainly think it is both uh, ethical and legal, depending on, on how you're using it, of course. Um, there's always the it depends answer, right? But, uh, you know, EFF, uh, our, our executive director is fond of wearing a shirt that says scraping is not a crime, and that is definitely a core EFF position. Um, you know, as I said, there are a lot of a lot of really good uses, um, and especially if it's publicly available information, then you know you want to be able to uh, analyze that information, all kinds of things like that. Um, where things get a little bit tricky is um, when you try to circumvent uh, ways that you might have access to that information. So that is where we get into um, where things become a crime, technically. Um, you know, uh, EFF certainly thinks that. So there's the. Um, the law, which is the CFAA, and now my brain is not remembering. Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Thank you. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to de acronym, acronym things in your head um, once you learn the acronyms. Um, you know, we think a lot of the penalties that people face under the CFAA, so for, um, you know, for going into systems, even if they, if they, if they circumvent a couple of things, um, are too harsh, right? Uh, we really think that, um, you know, unless there's some serious harm being done, that um, data scraping in general is, you know, it's a, it's a good tool. It should not be outlawed and um, certainly shouldn't, the law shouldn't be interpreted over broadly to prevent a lot of these good uses. 
Yeah, so in my head, or at least in terms of like this panel, maybe we'll talk about the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act first, mm -hmm. and then just talk a little bit more broadly about like privacy implications as it relates to people's data that's maybe getting scraped from the internet. Sure. Um, so the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, I wrote down the actual language, so I am not misquoting this, prohibits accessing a computer without authorization or in excess of authorization. So a brief history here is this initially was passed way back in the day mostly for mail and wire fraud. Over time it has gotten expanded and expanded and expanded. Um, it started to become more of just like a, your de facto hacker statute. And now it's come to a place, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a second, where it's if you violate basically a website terms of service, there's the question of are you um, violating the statute? So um, I will talk first about Aaron Schwartz. I'm sure most people in this room know who that is, but you know, one of the co-founders or early people with Reddit, he was violated under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Uh, and prosecuted quite heavily because what he was doing was scraping research articles from JSTOR and I think trying to make them publicly available. Um, so, of course, what happened with Aaron was a huge loss and tragedy and people really started questioning like how this statute in particular is used. And so earlier this year, there was a case called uh, HiQ versus LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Haley, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so HiQ versus LinkedIn um, was a really interesting case, I think. Uh, HiQ wrote kind of an automated script to scrape public profiles from LinkedIn. Um, their intent was to kind of use this for analysis of like data that they could draw from uh, public profiles on LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn wasn't such a fan of this, right? Um, possibly because they were thinking about making a product themselves that would analyze that data. Um, so they said, stop. They said, you know, please, uh, literally cease and desist. Um, uh, and so um, it went to court and uh, eventually Haiku prevailed um, because, you know, they found the access question wasn't as... Um, as much of a, a big deal there, right? Because it, even though it was violated by the terms of service, they weren't circumventing any sort of security measures or anything like that. So, yeah. So if you come back to the statute, like what I said, it's always this without authorization or in excess of authorization. So it was violating a company's terms of service, technically exceeding that kind of authorization. So I think in this case, it's a question, okay, if this data is available publicly, you know, is that with authorization or without authorization? So what I understand is LinkedIn basically sent the cease and desist order um, telling HiQ to stop taking the publicly available information from their website as they were building a product or had already built a product. That I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not either. Um, maybe <laughs> somebody what, out here knows. That's why I was, I was a little, uh, I was like, they at least plan to do it, maybe. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But to me, what's interesting in this case is, so the Supreme Court basically just sent it back to the Ninth Circuit. So in the United States, there is 11 circuits, right? <laughs> I should know I this. So. Um, Ninth Circuit is in California. Really, a lot of the tech policy and tech litigation happens in the Ninth Circuit because it's in California. And Ninth Circuit found that scraping publicly available data largely is, uh, should, is not a violation of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Um, with some limitations, and one that I thought was really interesting is they actually made a specific distinction between uh, scraping data from Facebook, um, because there's a certain level of like a, a user wall of mm -hmm. what you can access. Haley, I know you all filed a amicus brief, right, for both cases, the Van Buren case and the IQ case? Yes. Okay. You want to talk a little bit about that? Um, I will try. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think in general, you know, for LinkedIn especially, right, their, their position was really that scraping shouldn't be allowed, you know, for this type of information. And I think what was really concerning about that to us was that, you know, it would really undermine sort of this open access to information that we really prize on the internet, um, you know, and it would threaten the really, you know, it's very easy for a lot of um, Lawmakers and a lot of uh, a lot of uh, lawyers, you know, who are prosecuting, um, to say that all bots are bad, right? I think they use bots very pejoratively, and there are actually a, real, a lot of really really good bots out there um, that are socially valuable. So we were really worried about you know cutting off journalism research, you know, and then just just the ability to kind of go out on the on the internet and find information quickly. So um, in in both cases, we we sort of made that argument, right? That the that the scraping in both those cases, you know, was really socially valuable or, you know, 
just at least not um, not harmful. Mm-hmm. Um, certainly, there are times when you there is data scraping that you do want to balance some interests about you know sort of what harm it causes versus the benefit. But in both those cases, you know we we really made our, our argument that. Um, that automated scripts, for example, are totally legal. Um, EFF really has a, a core belief that code is speech, and so to suppress kind of the distribution of code or the publishing of code or the development of code is is really an infringement on, on First Amendment rights. And on okay, that special. is really interesting, <laughs> I think. Okay, so first I'll say from like a policy point, I know that there has been a couple bills, um, or at least there was one called like Aaron's Law. It still has not passed, mm-hmm. but it's been introduced a couple times, which would specifically exclude uh, terms of service from, or violating a terms of service as a violation of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Um, so first, do you have any takes about like what policy can do um, besides maybe Aaron's Law or what you think it should look like to be able to avoid these uh, unintended consequences, I guess, maybe? Yeah, well, I mean, I think certainly one thing with the CFAA in particular that we talk about a lot, so it's a, it's a felony, right? I mean, it's, yeah. like, it's like a very high penalty. So um, to, me, to me, that is that is a punishment that does not fit the crime. And so really, um, you know, making sure that if people are, are doing this, um, you know, that it's not something that will they, will they face years and years and years in prison as, as Aaron did and you know died, died by suicide eventually because he just did not want to want, did not want to live in that future um, so I think that's one thing um, you know we do want really good research exemptions um, you know First Amendment exempt I mean obviously you you aren't supposed to pass laws that violate the First Amendment, but um, you know, making sure that those uh, exemptions are really well crafted so that they cover a broad um, array of activities that people do um, in the real world, um, and uh, and are really tailored to um, to ensure that all, again all this good activity can continue um, from a policy standpoint. You know, also I think um, there are a lot of other things that are adjacent but would help, right? So better government transparency laws, for example, then people wouldn't necessarily have to go um, <laughs> go go looking for these things uh, and use these tools. Um, you know, better. Um, more permissive rules around intellectual property. So, you know, in the in the JSTOR case, it's really interesting, right? Because mm-hmm. it's it's academic research. So, right. is there some way that we could like work to to make some of that research more available? So, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's a a lot of this activity is a response to things being locked down or things right. being hidden away. And so, um, generally, more openness would also help. I think totally. Um, and I actually thought it was really interesting. PACER, which is like the uh, the court the court docket yeah. system, which like technically everybody should have access, you would think, to court records because it's supposed to be publicly available information, but it is also behind a paywall. <laughs> but earlier this year, they're like, oh, we're going to now make it free and available to everybody. It's like, yes, of course, you should have done that in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know. I used to get angry emails from readers who said, if you write about a court case, you have to put in the court case. And I'm like, if you have, you know, $800 <laughs> to throw my way, I would love to put up the court case. Yeah. Um, so going back to what you said earlier about code as speech, would you elaborate on that? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, that is, a, again, it's a it's a core EFF, um, core EFF belief. I think, you know, the way that um, that our executive director talks about it that I really like is, you know, it's it's an expression of, of thought in the same way that music is or writing is. Um, and so there is a, you know, there are um, attempts to prevent research into, you know, into certain areas. Um, there is attempt to prevent people from distributing certain types of code. But it really is a, a it is an expression of thought. Um, and so we really, really firmly believe that it is it is speech. Unequivocally? <laughs> well, there are always gray areas. Um, but this is where I get to put up my I'm not a lawyer sign. Yeah. <laughs> um, the reason I ask that, though, because I'm going to pivot to Clearview AI, sure. as I always do. Um, so Clearview AI um, raises a number of issues, um, but one is they use this defense of First Amendment. And largely what they are doing is taking publicly available social media profiles of people on the internet, could be you, could be a million other people, or was a million other people, and they use this to create a fish recognition database, which is privatized and of course means that um, whenever anybody purchases the technology with Clearview AI, they have this access to um, all of this database and all this information about people out there, who they are, what they're doing. Um, So recently, recently, earlier this year, um, 
they got sued under the Illinois Biometric Privacy Act, which is an act regulating um, a lot of things biometric, so things that are like your face, your irises, your fingerprints, things that uniquely identify you. And under this statute, you have to be able to get user consent, you have to have retention in place, you have to be able to destroy the data after a certain amount of time, et cetera, et cetera. Clearview obviously did not abide by these things, and there is this question about, okay, if they were scraping publicly available data from the internet, which is people's faces on social media profiles, um, going back to your point of, is that a First Amendment, when they're using that to create a facial recognition database, would you consider that speech? So, I had to do a lot of uh, reading of my colleagues' work. But, um, so the way that we look at it is, yes, actually Clearview's face printing does enjoy some First Amendment protection. Um, but what's important to us in the, in the Clearview case and what we argued in the brief is that it, it doesn't enjoy the strongest First Amendment protection because you have to balance it against the harm. So, right, when, I'm t when we're talking about, you know, um, like what's permissible and how you should be how you should be evaluating things. You do have to think about the the consequences, right? And so, in the case of Clearview, what we're arguing is that um, you know it um, in terms of how if you're a, a judge and you're applying all these tests and standards to to how you should be looking at things, that um, you know Clearview, for example, it their product is not really in the public interest, right? It's it's not mm -hmm. um, something that would um, addresses a, a public concern or um, is does it, yeah it does not concern a public issue so that's that's one thing that we're thinking about um, the other is that it's it's entirely commercial speech right it's yeah. like it's totally for um, their own benefit um, and so uh, it's yeah solely related to the economic interests of, of, the, of their uh, of their business and so uh, when faced with um, a a privacy law, which the Biometric Information Privacy Act, or BIPA, as I think we're probably going to call it a lot, yeah. um, is right. You have to think about okay, so what was what was the state of Illinois' intent in passing that law? What were the protections that they were trying to um, wh where they were they were trying to protect? You know, they're interested in pr protecting privacy. Um, you know, they're also interested in, pr in protecting um, expression of the public, right? Because um, if you're recording. Um, if you're recording video, you know, um, or, you know, sorry, uh, you want to, sorry, I got a little turned around there. If you're at a protest, um, right, you don't, you want to be able to um, know that people aren't going to uh, identify you at the protest necessarily, mm -hmm. right? Use surveillance footage to, to do that. Um, and so, uh, and then they're also interested in protecting security because face prints are often used as authentication. So mm -hmm. if you can pull face prints from anywhere and then use them. Um, so balancing all of those interests, right? We right. think um, Clearview's actions are um, on balance, worse for privacy than, you know, than necessarily right. the protections that they would enjoy from speech. Yeah, and that's actually a really good differentiation into the privacy harms, I guess, here. So maybe, like, maybe taking a step back a little bit, um, just stating, I guess, maybe like a little bit more in depth, what are the privacy harms when you are using web scraping? You know, when is it an issue and what are the potential harms with it? Yeah, so I mean, I think <laughs> it's, it's an interesting question, right? But I think... Um, Generally speaking, uh, you have to think about why people have put something online, right? Um, what their intent was to share, who the audience they intended to share with. Um, and so, you know, data scraping, definitely data scraping tools in general, we think are, are good. But um, you do have to think about what, what you're doing. You have to be responsible with it, with the tool like you would any other tool, right? Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was interesting in the, in the going back to the LinkedIn case, um, the court said that they found little evidence that users maintain an expectation of privacy um, on LinkedIn because, you know, when you're using LinkedIn, you're using it to be able to have recruiters look at you, have employers look at you, etc. Um, do people have a reasonable expectation of privacy by using social media, you think? Oh, another really good question. I mean, I... Th <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just putting you on the spot I know. Here. <laughs> um... <laughs> you can throw it back to me as well. <laughs> Well, I may after I answer. Um, I mean, I, I, again, I think right people are thinking about about their audience, right? So there are certain there are certain social media sites. It's all context dependent, right? There are certain social media sites. There are certain settings that you would put up um, that would change sort of your expectation of privacy. I think um, 
or what would be a reasonable expectation of privacy. Um, of course, the, getting to our privacy thoughts, like yeah. the, the companies may uh, know. I mean, they do know everything about you, but in terms of what you're projecting to the public, I think there are some some ex- expectations. So, but what do you think? Yeah, I mean, in, in privacy policy specifically, we have something called like secondary use, um, and being generally pretty opposed to that when it's not within your consent, or there's something called a like, contextual integrity. So, what is the purpose that you are sharing your information, your profile, etc.? I would probably say most people who upload a profile photo on Facebook are not expecting that another company is going to use that to generate a facial recognition database. Mm -hmm. Um, Is it reasonable that it might happen? It's a huge gray area, but I think um, because we've been in this framework where we think like, oh, like privacy is dead, you know, once your face is out there, it's out there forever, it allows companies to do really terrible things. <laughs> so I think if we like really shape, shift the narrative and shift the frame of thought to what do, con- what do consumers expect, what is the actual purpose for the original collection, mm-hmm. and then being able to have consumers control where that goes um, is really important. And I would encourage you not to think that privacy is dead because <laughs> it's not. Um, and, you know, they, they constantly need new information. So, um, Whatever we can do to change the paradigm now um, for the future, that that will that will help yeah. privacy in the long run. Um, there is a reason that most of my social media profiles are of my cat um, is my profile <laughs> picture. But on Twitter, which I use professionally as you know as the way to talk to my audience, it is it is my actual face. So um, that is a, an example of you know how different audio how you tailor for different audiences. Yeah, and it also, it's an interesting ethical question. I'm sure, again, people out here who do scraping have this thought, but like when you are training models based on publicly available data, it's not always going to be representative. Mm-hmm. So how is that continuing to exacerbate uh, inequalities, right? So maybe not everybody has access to internet. Maybe um, more people are, uh, from certain populations are more private about their information. Um, so I think that's also really interesting. And of course, we've talked about that quite a bit this weekend. But um, anyways, any any other thoughts or anything that we didn't really cover here? Well, I mean, I am um, I am kind of curious, like, you know, with the with the Clearview case, like, how do you see, you know, the idea of, of scraping and, and the balance of, of privacy? Like, what do you, what comes next? I'm always interested to hear from lawyers what comes next after a big case like that. Sorry, now I've thrown her on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, so I think, and we definitely agree on this, like biometric laws in particular are really, really interesting and really critical um, because unlike other forms of data, biometrics largely cannot be altered, right? So your face, you're not, unless you get drastic facial surgery, um, your face is your face, your iris is your iris, your fingerprints are your fingerprints, those typically don't change. So if it is, for whatever reason, somebody gets a hold of that and or can reverse engineer whatever data to be able to create that template, um, that can be problematic and would be problematic forever. Like it doesn't just go away. You can't just change like your credit card number or you can't, you can't yeah, change your yeah. face like you can change your credit card number right. uh, and things like that. So it's like if there's a breach, like you're you're under that harm forever. You're always under that level of like anxiety, which I think is really really interesting um and it makes you think okay like when you are scraping you know what is the purpose of the scraping and what kind of data are you scraping uh being really really intentional about that because these are it's not just data on the internet like maybe if you're just you know scraping real estate you know that doesn't matter but if you're actually scraping things from people like remember that these are real people yeah i think that's a very good point yeah um I don't have anything else. Uh, any? Do you? Otherwise, I'm happy to open it up to yeah, questions. You can open it up. Um, I will take this moment to remind our audience to rate your rate the panel in the DragonCon app. Um, if you'd like this panel or more panels like it to come up next year. Yeah, you can come up to the mic uh, since we're being recorded. <laughs> Thanks very much for your presentations. Uh, what are the legal protections against jigsawing? So the, the use of bits and pieces of data that might be publicly available on someone to try to stitch together A, a unique profile, and then B, attach that to an identifiable mm-hmm. individual. I mean, as an example, many of us 
need to give out things like our cell phone number and or email address to interact with pretty much any company on the internet right now to, to order anything mm -hmm. from them. Are, are there specific legal protections against someone stitching together a profile of you? I'm curious from the journalistic and, and legal perspective. <laughs> No, we're both, I'll, I'll we're start. Look at each I'll other start. Again. <laughs> um, and I've said this literally on every single panel, but I will say it again. Uh, there is no consumer data privacy law. So to answer your question, largely no. Um, there is a lot of data aggregators, which that is literally their job is mm -hmm. to be able to put together that data and try to put together a profile. It might not be with your specific name, but it might be with your device identifier. It might be with, you know, whatever. And regardless, that still can come back to you. Um, so sorry that the answer is largely no from my perspective. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, there are some, I've seen some drafts of legislation that talk about, you know, combinations of data sets and, and trying to use that. But, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of resistance um, to passing privacy law. So Yeah, and I will say, like, usually with privacy law, they, they try to think about, okay, there is certain levels of, like, anonymous data. Like, is it impossible to be able to put this data back together? And, like, maybe by itself, yes. But if you are combining it with other forms of data, it makes it easier, of course, to be able to identify people. So once you get to that level of, like, with XYZ information, what's the probability of being able to re-identify this person is really important to be able to have that granularity of, of risk. Yeah. I'm wondering if, if you could speak to like the legal implications of um, code is speech and specifically like Clearview AI being protected by, by that code is speech or the First Amendment. Oh, man. Uh, honestly, I am not a First Amendment expert, which is why I was asking Haley more than anything about it. Well, I definitely enjoyed the protection of the First Amendment. I don't know that I would consider myself a 1A scholar, but, um, you know, I mean, that's, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to repeat myself but I, a little bit, but I, I do think, um, you know, the activity itself is protected in some ways by the First Amendment, but definitely you have to balance the, sorry, the, the scraping activity is protected by the First Amendment, in our opinion. But um, you do have to balance it with the with the other interests. So yeah, so there's different levels, as far as I know, based on remembering con law from law school. <laughs> there's different levels of scrutiny for speech, right? So you have um, a level of strict scrutiny and immediate scrutiny, um, and that I think is based on the activity, I believe. Yeah. So if you're a public person in a public square yelling about how the senator passed this terrible bill, then like I think that's a certain level. But once you are doing commercial speech, I think it again, I could be very much wrong here, so do not take this as legal advice. <laughs> um, but um, it does have that lower level of of, um, of scrutiny to it, so they have to have a higher threshold to meet, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, because it's commercial speech, it's not a private citizen expressing concerns about things that are in the public um, and affecting the public. What was their speech? There was, like, that's about, there was no expression of anything. That's what I'm struggling Yeah, I mean, I... Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, re repeating it for the the camera. For the um, so he asked, to what extent is uh, Clearview AI's speech like? What was their argument that what they were doing is speech? Yeah. So I mean, I think in general, again, as EFF, like we consider um, code speech, and so <laughs> you're shaking your head. <laughs> um, look, I mean, I don't like what Clearview did, but I do think that they have, you know. When you're writing laws in particular, right, you have to think about not only who's going to do it, but what they're doing, right? So it's like scraping in general, I think, is, is you know, a thing that can be used for good and should be protected and should not be suppressed. And so when it comes to something like Clearview, like they were scraping. And so that is activity that we think enjoys some First Amendment protection. But, you know, on balance, I do really think that the privacy harms outweigh the, the protection that they enjoy. So um, that's why we really talk about the balancing tests, right? Because if you outlawed scraping altogether, that would that would be, in our, in our view, very wrong um, and ultimately harmful to society. But there are cases where you have to think about, you know, what you how you're applying that tool. And it's just important to remember the law is so far behind technology. So yeah. <laughs> when right. we are talking about this, the case law is so new and everything is evolving so quickly that we are trying to understand it ourselves yeah. <laughs> as legal experts because, yeah, these laws were passed and to the extent that we're applying them like First Amendment to 
the digital era, um, how do you how do you do that? Because technically, scraping is just like taking information and using that information for a, a purpose. Mm -hmm. So at a very broad level, that's probably speech. Um, I think Clearview just tried to take that same argument and it just the courts kind of saw right through yeah. it in my opinion being like look this is not it's, actual speech to be clear you know eff doesn't agree with clear resource <laughs> argument but we do agree that they enjoy some protection just not that it outweighs you know everything else that they're doing just to comment on that one Please um, do. pgp and the first amendment like that is where the first amendment protections from for code came from that had to do with encryption standards and actually publicly distribution of encryption code, even weighing against the harm of state active, state active terrorism or all of the harm that can happen from it. And when looking at all of the good, that's that's where we get our First Amendment protection for code. So that it's actually one of the longest precedences that exist for uh -huh. technology because it was, I think it was like late 90s yep. it was a long time ago relative for technology cases right and, and it was then, a weapon right there yeah yeah and, and the in the department of defense was making the argument that encryption shouldn't be publicly available to citizens domestically or foreignly because of the use of it in, in weapon systems and um then a question to it you guys have talked a lot about the um application of like what clearview did in scraping as a company but as an individual most technology especially with open source software and the probably the majority of what Clearview is doing came from freely available public code that exists today that they cobbled together to do something. The, te the capabilities exist for the private individual to do these things as well. And even if they didn't, like things like vocal uh, recognition creation and, and patterns, those things have been reverse engineered by just people who are bored in their spare time. Those capabilities come back to the public. So there seem to be a lot of concern about the harm of what a company could do as a corporation but individuals are capable of doing the same things. And what the outlook of that is saying, like, if you're just saying it's bad because a company can do it, but it's okay if an individual can do it, like, that, that seems like a, a misbalance of you know, more of an anti-corporatism standpoint than an actual looking at the bottom line issues associated with anybody having the capability to do these things. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think it's from my perspective, specifically important for large companies like Clearview AI because they have the resources to deploy it so much further than a lot of individuals. And this d doesn't mean that they, you know, individuals who are using this cannot be harmful. That obviously is, of course, true. But to the extent that they can use it, like at this point, Clearview AI can identify at least half the world um, and can sell that to whatever company or person that they want to. I know um, far less individual developers who have that level of uh, capabilities. So with this being a civil trial, it sounded if I, the impression I got was the scraping was not a violation of the terms of service. It was the ruling was based on other factors, the privacy and you know. So in the Aaron Schwartz case, mm -hmm. he violated the terms of service as JSTOR. Now that was a criminal case and not a civil case. Correct. So with the loosening of the terms of service as being a violation of C, of a violation of a legal standard, not a criminal standard, right? Does that start carrying over to CFAA where now they would be less likely to be able to charge somebody just because they downloaded too fast. Sorry, can you restate the question again? <laughs> so the, the precedent in the civil case where the scraping, even though it was against the terms of service, was not the justification for the ruling. For it, what They didn't say uh, you linked in one because you can't violate that terms of service, right? They, they ruled based on other factors. But in Aaron Swartz's case, he violated the terms of service by downloading too fast. Basically, you can only download one at a time. He did it automatedly, basically scraping. Mm -hmm. Does that civil ruling in judgment start carrying over to the criminal side? Really interesting question. <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Uh, uh, we are we are very lucky in that uh, our EMF's general counsel just walked in. Kurt, can I can I pull, pluck you up onto this panel to answer that question? I'm so sorry. I saw him nodding his head. I was like, I feel like he has <laughs> thoughts that are going to be way better than ours. Here. Um, 
Hey, everybody. I'm Kurt Opsel. I'm the general counsel at EFF. Um, yes. So the CFAA uh, is a, both a civil and a criminal statute, and the precedents set uh, apply both civilly and criminally. So in the case of uh, Aaron Swartz, I think the high Q case uh, would have been a very good case, uh, you know, in, in Aaron Swartz's defense. Uh, I mean, there was a lot of weirdness with that case. Uh, the, the weirdness being that it wasn't so much that he broke the terms of service, he just was downloading it in a manner that they didn't like. Uh, and he was entitled to it sort of one at a time, but he went into a server closet and, you know, connected directly to it. Um, and so that's a little bit different from the terms of service, but uh, HiQ was applying Van Buren. Van Buren had said, you know, the gates are up or gates are down, uh, depending on your metaphor, that's either a drawbridge, which is down, or a gate, I think it's a uh, port glass. Anyway, so it was up, and that meant that it was it was open, it was available, and you didn't have to hack to do it. And I would say that connecting an Ethernet port, and even in a server closet, isn't a hack, isn't a technical protection measure. Now, Van Buren also had this mysterious footnote 8. And in footnote 8, they said, we're leaving for another day, whether it's required to have breaking a technical barrier. So that may be a little bit unsettled still. But you can draw from how it was applied in high Q that a circumstance in which it was uh, rules that were doing it, you can't do this. That would be a helpful case, but not exactly on point with the Aaron Swartz case. But nevertheless, uh, it would have been a great thing uh, for, for Aaron at the time. Thank you. <laughs> you, you want to join if you want. <laughs> Um, so the law that makes it illegal to access stuff you don't have the rights to, does that exclude the government? And has a company ever been charged under that law for accessing data that they have and possess but aren't supposed to use? So like they have medical records but they're not supposed to look at them, but they do? Like they're their records? Uh, that was my... yeah. So if I may. Uh, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act uh, has a uh, exemption in it for uh, an authorized uh, investigation. So uh, uh, if a law enforcement uh, agency is engaged in a law enforcement investigation, that is not covered by the CFAA or it's not a CFAA violation. It is, is uh, uh, so it's, it would not be useful in saying that the government got access to data improperly. You might be able to say it under other laws, but it's not a CFAA uh, issue. If they got it outside of the context of a law enforcement investigation, uh, that could be a problem. And that was actually the issue in, in the Van Buren case. So the Van Buren case was the, did you go, go over that? Not bit. really, but. Oh, so the first Supreme Court case on Van Buren, sorry, the first Supreme Court on the CFAA was uh, US v. Van Buren. And uh, Van Buren was a police officer uh, here in Georgia, as I recall. Uh, and uh, he used the police database to look up a license plate, not for police purposes, but because he had received a bribe. Uh, and uh, the sensible bribe was paying him uh, $5,000 to look up the license plate of uh, somebody who worked at a strip club to see if that person was an undercover officer or a uh, ordinary worker and uh, it was actually a sting to go after Van Buren but you know he got caught up in that uh, so he was accessing private information from the license plate database that he was authorized to access for purposes of law enforcement but not authorized for non-law enforcement purposes such as taking a bribe to, to get this information uh, and that was the theory of the case that went up to the Supreme Court, whether that was a violation when he totally had access to the database but had a purpose limitation on it. And the Supreme Court said that wasn't a CFAA crime, that uh, that wasn't a hacking crime because he was entitled to have access to the, uh, the database. The gates, the portcullis was up, leaving the gates open. And you now this could be other crimes, right? Bribery, you know, misuse of, you know, uh, theft of honest services. There's a lot of other things that were wrong with what Van Buren did, and it was very invasive of privacy. But that wasn't the question for the court whether whether Van Buren did wrong, 
uh, and abused his powers as a police officer, but rather whether that was a hacking crime. And that was the, the answer was it wasn't a hacking crime. And I'll follow up to that um, on the privacy level. So whenever there's a privacy law for consumers that typically does not apply to the government, um, which makes a lot of people not happy, um, <laughs> of course. So when I'm talking about the Illinois Biometric Privacy Act, which is what Clearview had violated by collecting all of these photos without people's consent, um, yeah, it only it only apl would apply to them. On the other level, um, on the government side, there are certain uh, parameters around what the government can collect, at least on the federal level. So they're fairly regulated or um, overseen by the Department of Homeland Security, at least as it relates to biometrics. Um, however, that is the federal government that does not apply usually to like state law enforcement. And I know that's been an issue in terms of law enforcement purchasing data from places like Clearview or other um, other types of facial recognition companies who are not regulated under the law and being able to get more information on people through those means rather than, you know, like due process <laughs> and uh, the, all of the warrant requirements. Yeah. And so the, it is a hot, as you said, like a hot area of legislation to kind of like figure out how to, how to, um, affect that relationship between, you know, data sale from private companies to public entities. But, um, it, it is. It's a. It's a really tricky problem, and I think you know you often do see law enforcement exemptions in in a lot of um, in a lot of in a lot of laws because they they do want to preserve that. So. Any other questions? Come up to the mic. Otherwise, we're around. All if right. you all want to well, talk, well, Kurt Opsel, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks all. Thank you.